Hello, is everybody coming on in? Oh, hi, Sister Ayana. Good to see you. <laughs> Hello, Sister Ashley. Um, good to see you. Good to see you and the family. Oh, PTL, Sister Maria, come on in. Hello, Sister Ayana. How you doing? <laughs> Good to see everybody on tonight. Good to see everybody on tonight. Waiting for a few more people to come in, and I hope everybody had a wonderful day. Um, yeah, in spite of everything else, praise the Lord. Amen. Um, that's going on. We know that God is able. Amen. Just waiting for a few more people to come on in. Um, and um, hey, Brother Cliff, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And um, we're waiting for some people, I guess, to get on the phone line as well. And then we'll start. Sister Anne-Marie, good to see you, good to see you. Hallelujah. That's right, that's right, that's right. Good, good to see everybody, good to see everybody. Did you all have a wonderful day today, um, yesterday? Is everybody well? I know you can't, I can't see you nodding, so you have to type. <laughs> I hope everybody is well. Just waiting for a few more people to come on in. Amen. Just waiting for a few more people. Amen. Amen. Always good with Jesus. That's right. Amen. We're doing good. We're doing good. Amen. Amen. Don't listen to too much of that news, okay? Um, that's how you get stressed out. Wake up in the middle of the night, breaking out in cold sweat. That's not good. That's not good at all. Oh, wow. Hello, Sister Nicole. PTL. You had a good day? <laughs> I wish I could see your, face, your faces. Sister Linda, good to see you. God is good. God is good. Amen. Amen. 30 more seconds. Praise the Lord. Let's enter the presence of the Lord. Others will join, but we're going to go ahead and start because you guys uh, came in on time. So we'll go ahead and start. All right. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, we are so grateful for the love of Jesus. Thank you for keeping your people, protecting us and guiding us, God, allowing our minds and our hearts Lord Jesus, to be stayed upon you. We're grateful, God, that all that's been happening, God, you've really been there for us. God, the Psalm 91 is so true that, Lord, a thousand may fall out at our side and 10,000 at our right hand, but it won't come near our dwelling. God, we pray. We pray today that you would bring peace to every home, God, of those who call upon you. And every mind and every heart, Lord God, let our, our hearts and our minds be still, Lord God, and to see the salvation of the Lord. And God, you are sovereign, and whatever you choose to do, we give you the glory, the praise, and the honor. And Lord, help us to find so many different ways to touch lives and to help people, and to, Lord God, cause people to see your face. Lord, through our lifestyles, through how we deal with this uh, pandemic, God, and we're just asking you to open doors and strengthen us, and we will give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. And everybody say, Amen. Hallelujah. God is good. It's good to see you all in here tonight. Amen. God is able, and we know that he is a good God. And um, uh, I just want to make a couple of quick announcements, and then um, I'll do it again at the end. And um, we will try our best to not keep you long tonight, but I want to share a word with you. Uh, the first thing is um, we had the, um, a predominant amount of people 
uh, that said that they preferred that the Bible study be at 7 o'clock. Well, the truth is, because it's recorded and it's out there on Facebook, those who want to watch it later can watch it. But uh, for those who are always here, um, pretty much everybody said they didn't mind that it was 7. And some pretty frankly just said, we prefer it at 7. So we're going to, as of next week, uh, be on for Bible study on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Okay, so get the word out there and tell all the people that you're inviting that the time has changed. That's number one. Number two, this coming Friday, we're going to be having a special online prayer, uh, corporate prayer. And um, that's this Friday coming at 6 p.m. So get the word out as well. I'll be putting up the invite on tomorrow. And um, we're going to have prayer in a way that we've never done it before online. So uh, you don't want to miss it. And uh, you want to make sure that you get somebody else to uh, come online and uh, be a part of what we're doing. I've been watching on YouTube specifically and Facebook uh, these um, postings of people in operating rooms praying. I saw today, I don't know if it was a nurse or a doctor, but she was on her knees and she was calling out to God. I mean, the woman was praying like she was full of the Holy Ghost and she just kept praying about the people that were coming in, that God's presence would be upon them and that God would heal and deliver. I mean, they were having a prayer meeting. We see police officers literally blocking a, a, a whole road and they're just standing there, their cars with the lights flashing and they're praying, state troopers. We're, we're living in a different world. And you know what? If this is what it takes to get people to see God, then this is what it takes. And every child of God should just say, God, we don't like this, but we appreciate the fact that it's causing people to see you. So let's pray um, and, and believe God. I'm going to be fasting on Friday those who can fast. I know some of you are on medication, fast a meal, but um, I, I'm going to fast on Friday and I want to, I want us to just get online and I want us to pray that God will begin to move on lives. Amen. We need deliverance from this thing. So we're going to pray uh, focused prayers on very specific topics. Amen. Hallelujah. So tonight I just wanted to kind of, um, you know, continue with what we were going through again. And um, this is the meaning of life. And we're going back to the book of Ecclesiastes. And we're talking about the meaning of life. Amen. If you um, can text somebody and tell them to get on right now, uh, do so before I get started. I'm going to try to put the notes up there and leave them up there just a little bit longer than I usually do. So that you can take a picture of it and take some notes down. I can't put all the notes out there um, and some of the talking points. I don't have them written down or things, so you'll just have to take notes, all right? But I'll try not to go too fast. Amen. Some people say I'm moving too fast. And um, so we're going to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, if you want to um, go to your Bibles, and also Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Those are the two chapters we'll be going uh, through tonight. I want to talk about the meaning of life. And especially for Christians, sometimes we're looking at life in a way that is not even biblical. Theologically, it's not sound. And so we want to look at some key things tonight. And uh, sometimes that's the issue with Christians. Uh, we, we don't really look at the details of our lives. We look at the overarching uh, influences that um, we deal with every day, things that impact us. And we are very reactionary in a lot of um, our living for God. And um, we need to not do that because that's how we miss out on the will of God. And that's how we are moving so fast. Sometimes we can't hear the voice of God. So we need to slow it down a little bit. I was thinking today about fear and how fear can cause an individual to panic. And do you know what panic does to an individual? It causes them to freeze up. And when you freeze, you are no longer in control of your destiny. When you freeze because of panic due to fear, you are not even in your uh, right mind, or should I say, you do not, you no longer have the capacity 
to make right judgments because your fear leads you. And when you panic, you become reactionary. And so when we are serving God, we need to figure out how are we going to live our lives so that we don't panic and fear. Sunday, I mentioned something and I thought about it a lot after I logged off. Um, it was that, you know, there are people out there, they're, they're seeking God right now. They're on Facebook. Um, and of course, even when we get back to church and in the church building, they may even show up for a hot minute. <laughs> you know, they, they may show up for a hot minute, walk in for one week or two weeks. And then when life settles back in, you don't see them anymore. You see, th there are people out there. They only want God when they want him to bring them out of something. And that's not what we want. We want to live for God and be committed and consistent in our walk with God, no matter what's happening in our lives. And we should not allow this situation to just deal with our immediate needs, push us to God because of the things that we need now. But after everything is done and, and we're back to normalcy, if we'll ever get there, I'm not sure, but... You know, we need to get to that place where we say, God, I love you. You are my everything. You're my hope. Amen. My strength for today, my hope for tomorrow. And that's what we want to kind of deal with tonight. All right. So we're going to be talking a little bit about um, our decisions, what we do, what we see in the world. Ecclesiastes chapter one, beginning at ver uh, chapter three, beginning at verse one. It says there is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be, to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, Wow, that sounds like now, right? Social distancing. <laughs> Amen. The Bible talks about this. It says a time to embrace and a time, uh, you know, to refrain from embracing. Isn't that what it's saying here? A time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend. Mighty God. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. And verse 12 tells us, I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. That each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. This is the gift of God. And so here we find the preacher, he is being uh, pretty deep here. He's talking about life's um, moments in, in spite of what's happening. Some of it may be tragic, but there's a time for everything in life. We want the good times always, don't we? We want every single day to be a sunny day, never any rain. We want every single day to be a day when we don't feel pain, our hearts not broken, but that's not the way it is. I mean, time, you know, just, just in circumstances will happen to all men. The book of Proverbs tells us that even the good will suffer just as the bad suffers because we're living in, 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 in the body, in this flesh, and we're certainly living um, in, in, in a place and time where we have lost dominion and we need to learn how to live on this earth now with that limited dominion that we have had because of Adam and Eve. Now, in the first two chapters that we discussed, um, the preacher described the extent of his search for the purpose of life under the sun in, in chapter three. Um, and, and of course, when we go to chapter four, we're going to look at his observations, his observations. And he saw some crazy things. We've seen very wicked people, don't we? We see them nowadays, don't we? We see the way people act toward one another, how they're treating each other. 
um, because of different reasons, uh, different outlook on life uh, di from different cultures. And so you don't like that person because their culture rubs you the, the wrong way. We, we see wickedness because of the, the, the darkness of men's hearts. And we are the children of light. And so that kind of wickedness should never be in the, the children of light. Because the, the, the things that causes an individual to be wicked comes from a heart of darkness. And we should have hearts that's filled with the light of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so next, um, he describes some things here, um, what he saw under the sun. In other words, every day when he got up, his observation showed him how humanity acted and reacted to circumstances in life. And we find so many times that um, when there should have been judgment and righteousness, that he saw wickedness and iniquity. Instead of judgment and righteousness, he saw um, wickedness and iniquity. Remember what the Lord um, said to Noah? He said, Noah, I'm going to destroy the earth because men's hearts are wicked continually. And that's what we as Christians are dealing with today. That's why sometimes as a child of God, you feel burned out, don't you? When you're talking to people about God and it's like they don't want God. And then you feel like, why bother? Why even go the extra mile to try to help somebody if they don't want to help themselves? But then when it's your family member, you, 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 you pine over them and you cry over them. See, God doesn't want us to just pine and cry over our own family members. He wants us to be concerned about the world equally. Amen. And so if you can find something in your heart because you want your family member saved, find it in your heart to love someone else that God has placed in your life. So let's look at the observations because here he is. He's reasoning in his heart, this, this, this particular um, preacher here, Solomon, uh, the king of Israel. He's reasoning in his heart that God is going to judge the righteous and the wicked and that there's a time under heaven for everything. Wickedness will be here. We can pray that God will keep us from it. Sickness will be here. We can pray that God will keep us from it. But those things are here because of sin. When sin was released upon this earth because of the decisions that Adam and Eve made, uh, we all were born under that weight of sin. And so we find here that the, 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 the writer is looking at some things. And the first thing that I want to look at here is the inexplicable purpose of God. And this is one of the things that, that he sees. He sees that there's a time to everything and a season to everything, um, a purpose to everything under heaven. And, and, and sometimes we want to know why, why things are happening, right? Lord, why, why am I going through this? Why am I struggling the way I'm struggling? Why is it that God, I'm, I'm, I'm praying my heart out and, and still I have to go through these things? This is exactly what he was going through. And it's interesting how Jesus responded to his disciples when they were concerned about how they were going to fare now that Jesus was going away. Um, they were like, Master, how, are we going to be delivered from this Roman rule, this uh, are we going to be delivered from ro Roman dominance? And, and, and Jesus gave them a pretty simple, um, you know, strategic answer in Acts chapter 1 and uh, verse 7 through 8. He says, uh, beginning at verse 7, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. That's Acts chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, notice how Jesus just changes his focus here from earthly kingdom-related issues to kingdom responsibilities. The Lord is saying to these men that were concerned, imagine they were under Roman rule, Roman tyranny. And Jesus almost ignores the, their concern. He, he kind of changes the subject. And he says, listen, it's not for you to know the times nor seasons that the Father is uh, fixed by his own authority. 
but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the and, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, I don't want you to think that the Lord was minimizing what they were going through because they were going through some very um, serious cons uh, con issues and concerns here. They were no longer free as, as, as Israelites. Uh, they were slaves to the Roman Empire. So let's, let's consider what that meant. That meant that the Romans could take their children and bring them into slavery. And a lot of those children were, were taken from uh, parents and, and from their siblings and placed in homes. And they were out there uh, as slaves in somebody else's home being mistreated. Wives were taken from husbands, husbands from wives. Sons were conscripted into the Roman army. And keep in mind that Jesus was crucified on the cross, right? Like a, a, just a thief and a murderer, which he was not. But that's what they were doing to the Israelites. They were murdering them. They, they were using harsh methods to destroy the lives of these people and keep them subjugated. So it, when, when the disciples were saying to Jesus, Master, you're going away, but it, is it time for us to be delivered now? And Jesus simply said, it's not time. It's not for you to know the times nor the seasons. That's only for the Father to know. Let me tell you, I know sometimes we want to know everything that's going on in our lives. We really do. But God is saying, you know what? It's not for you and I to know that. God, we're going to see it in a moment. He keeps things for himself. We lost that ability to commune with God the way Adam and Eve did. Remember Adam and Eve? When the Lord came down in the cool of the day, they walked with God in the garden. I'd no doubt believe that God shared some things with them and um, talked from his heart and listened to Adam and Eve as they spoke about the possibilities. And when they sinned, they lost that relationship. Now we got some of that back, if you will. Not all of it, but some of it, because we are our own worst enemy. And uh, many times we we put ourselves in situations where we, we become like a curtain that separates us from God because we want what we want when we want it. Amen? We, we, we desire what we desire when we desire it. Mm -hmm. And we do what we want to do when we want to do it. Till we have impending doom, then we start fasting and praying and seeking God. Hmm, Holy Ghost, help us tonight. But it's interesting that even though they were going through what they were going through, that they struggled. They struggled with the master. Lord, aren't you going to bring us deliverance? And the Lord says, listen, um, there are some things that you, you're not going to know. Not now. Not on this earth. Not while we're in these bodies that fail. Fail to live for God like we ought to live for God. Fail to hear the voice of God like we need to hear the, the, the voice of God. Fail to submit when we're supposed to submit. And the Lord is saying, no, 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 no. There's some things that we will never know, not on this earth. Because man has an inability to find God's purpose, not necessarily because God isn't trying to reveal everything. Or some things, I should say. But because of our stubborn nature. And because our, un, of our unwillingness to seek him deeply from the heart, to be willing to commit beyond uh, the norm and, you know, to give up some things in our lives. So there's some things we just we don't want to give up. And, and God is saying, well, I can't release some things to you. You see, he's going to bless us. But our level of blessings depend on our ability to say, God, I'm going to give it all up to you. And so we find here that there are some very interesting things. God uh, has put it in man to seek out what he cannot find. Now, look, here again, the preacher is asking, what profit is there when I'm going out there working every day? Right? Right? He's saying, what, 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 what is it doing for me? I'm, I'm not even happy at the job that I'm working at. That's why um, there are people who really believe, and I can't say I um, disagree with them, that you should never do or work at something you're not happy with. If you end up doing it for 30 years and you're not happy, mm, that's kind of rough, right? Yes, we have to live. My suggestion to a lot of people when they talk to me about this is this. Don't ever stay where you're not happy, but don't just quit because who's going to pay your bills when you quit? 
Don't start talking about the devil this, the devil that, because you started having a crappy attitude on the job, and then you get fired because you hate the boss, you hate the job, and now you are in a situation where you cannot pay your bills. That is not the will of God. Be wise. Use them like they're using you. Go to work every day. Don't work for them. Work for God. Work for your ability to pay your bills and work on something else in the meantime. Be wise. Think here and don't let your emotions run away with you and cause you to be, be in jeopardy. Lose your job because of a bad attitude and then you're not happy ultimately worse than you were before because before you were unhappy, but now you're unhappy, can't pay your bills, you're super unhappy. So find something else to, 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 to do. You know, go and get an education in something else that you want to do. And then go out there and or learn a trade, a skill, do something that you're happy with. And then well, once you get that under your belt, you look at the boss and you go, uh, see ya. And don't say, wouldn't want to be you. Don't burn your bridges. You might have to go back for a while. Amen. But here we need to use wisdom. The, the, the writer is saying here, I'm, I'm working, but I'm not happy. But he's, he's doing all these things for a different reason. And some of the things are pretty interesting. Given the, 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 the given man, God has given man the task which, which, with which to be occupied, uh, to be occupied. I, I, men, we work, we, you know, when I say men, we're talking about women as well. Man, in, in other words, the, the human race, uh, God made everything beautiful in its time and God put eternity in man's heart. Amen. We were born, but we, we see future. I mean, we may not even live beyond a certain age, but we see beyond that. And, and we see the possibilities of life. And, and look, Noah probably would have never thought that a man would be on the moon. But look, we've been there and back. We've done that. And we're doing so much more that um, men from Jesus's era would, have, would not even believe. The science fiction of it, if you will. But here we find that um, the, 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 the writer is saying that God has placed something in a man's heart to go out there and work. Yet, there's something that God has not given man, and that is a, an understanding of God's mind and God's heart. We don't know what God wants except for the Word of God. We, we don't know. Let me give you a case in point. You serve God with all your heart. And you're loving God, and there are those of you, you know you've tried everything, and, 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 and you've, you've fasted, you've prayed, you seek God every day, you've got a prayer life, morning, noon, and night, you go out there, you're not trying to hurt anybody, you're not cursing anybody out, no matter what they do to you, you turn the other cheek, and you still feel frustrated with life because you feel like, God, when am I coming out of this thing? When am I coming out of this situation that I'm in? And you're wondering, is God even listening to me? There are some things that God will never reveal to you and I. But when you get down the road, just a little bit, might be a year, a few months, or a few years, and you look back, you go, wow, that was the hand of God. But you didn't see it while you were in it. But once you got down the road, you started to see some things happening in the past, and you're like, oh my goodness, that was God. Look, if I didn't go through that, I wouldn't have been able to accomplish this. Do you understand what I'm saying? I remember, and I've, I've told this story in our church so many times, but I had a boss. She was mean. She was the most wicked person that I've ever met in my life. And, and, and this woman just made her day just finding things to destroy my life. But you know what? While I was in it, I didn't feel it. But years down the road, I started to realize how all of that shaped me, not just to become a pastor, but shaped me in the world of business and caused me to be a thinker on my feet when I wasn't before, to cause me to be a person that dug deep for knowledge and, and tried to find the wisdom in things and how to make things work better, to be above average because there was no other way I could have survived back then, but it allowed me to grow in ways that I would have never grown. And I would have never accomplished the things that I accomplished in my life. And I can tell you stories upon stories of other people who've gone through the same things. So while you're going through it, which he, this writer was, and he's like, I'm not happy with what I'm doing. And it 
frustrates man, he says, because God is not revealing his mind. God is not revealing his heart. Someone once said, but he, God, has left us in the dark so we can never know what he is up to, whether he's coming or going. Didn't Jesus talk about the wind? He says it blows, it comes and it, it goes, and you don't know where it's coming from and you don't know where it's going. All you know is that you just felt it a couple of nights ago. No, it was actually last night. The winds yesterday uh, uh, and the rain and the thunder. Uh, uh, we even had hail here in New York and um, on Long Island. I don't know about anywhere else, but on Long Island, I looked out the window and I saw all this ice covering the cars, covering the ground. And the thunder shook in. I was on the phone with somebody and they, they, they said to me, what was that? The thunder shook the entire house. But then by the evening, it was gone. By this morning, the wind was gone. Now it's somewhere else. That's how God is. There are things that will happen in our lives. And the writer was saying, we, we need to figure out life or we won't be happy. And that's not how God works. Because God has placed it within our hearts that even though we have an inability to find out his purpose, we need to come up with some serious conclusions, amen, in our lives because God knows what we need. And so the writer was saying that we, we need to see what is best for me. So let me just talk about that for a little bit. While we don't know what God wants out of our lives, we should take time to read the Word of God, understand the mind of God based on the Word of God, the expectations of God for our lives based on the Word of God and live thereby. Now, once we've done that, God has given you and I wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. We have to use that. Someone will say, well, um, well, I need a job that's going to pay X amount. Well, the only way you're going to get that job is to do some works on your own. You know, they call that education. Doesn't necessarily mean school, but if you're going into a situation, some of you are educated, but you're going into another line of uh, work or career, you can go and educate yourself and you can get information, knowledge on all that you need to make you more um, marketable when you go in for an interview, for instance, right? So that when you sit in front of that interviewer and they ask you a multitude of questions, you're firing off answers like this and they're, want, they're wondering, wow, this person is very knowledgeable. But then to be able to go and to do something that will enhance your life is a God-given gift. And the writer understood that. Because he says everything that God has given to us is so that we can be happy here on earth. And God will give us the, the, the corn in the, uh, in the field and he'll give us the wheat in the field. But if we don't go out and pick the corn and if we don't go out and pick the wheat, and then if you don't take the wheat and the corn out of the barn and, and, and work on it and you know make sure you can get the grains out and put it in a pot, you'll go hungry with a ton of wheat in the barn and a ton of corn out there in the baskets. Do you understand what I'm saying? God gives us wisdom. And the, 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 the writer here is, is concluding that God wants us to rejoice in the good things in our lives. So it's now let's break this down for just a hot minute here. Sometimes we want to look at only the bad things in our lives, right? The bad things are the, the things that brings fear. And fear causes you and I to panic. Panic causes you and I to freeze. And then we start to make bad decisions. When you get into a situation where you're unhappy, don't just look at the things that are making you unhappy. Start thinking about those things that will make you happy. Yet yeah, until you find another job, yes, until you get out of this situation that you're living in, you know, you can find the good in the bad. There's a song that I've sung for years Amen. You know, make me an instrument of your love each day. May I remember your children, Lord, every time I get on my knees and pray. But it says this, let me see the good side. Oh, yes. In the bad side of all my days, make me an instrument. And that's important for the child of God to keep in mind. Lord, help me to see the good things during my bad experiences 
that will make me what I need to be, God, to elevate me to the next level. Lord, wherever it is you're trying to take me, I want to get there. But I want to get there with joy. The writer, this, this preacher, started to realize some things, albeit in his old age. Some of you are too young for the mess that you're sitting in. Depression. Feeling like, you know, all you ever see is despair. And you're living there. Get out of it. Pastor, how am I going to get out of it? Start looking at the good things, not the bad things. You're focusing way too much on the negatives. Come on now. It's raining out there. It's thundering out there. It's lightning out there. But my goodness, my garden is growing. I'm going to have something to eat. Kind of a way of looking at life. And so here he is. He's saying that the, 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 the life that we're living, there's some good things there. He says, eat and drink. He's not just saying, just go out there and have pleasure and don't worry about anything. He, when he says, eat and drink, amen, and find satisfaction in the work that you're doing, what he's saying is, live your life. Yeah, there's COVID-19. Put on a mask and go live your life. Make sure you're wiping stuff down, though. Don't be touching stuff and then touching your face and, you know, rubbing your eye. <laughs> no, wait, wisdom. But, you know, mask up, glove up, go out there like Batman and Robin. Come on now. Be prepared for the fight against a virus. But in the meantime, you can live your life. Amen. Go out there, do what you got to do. And so he says the the reason why God does these things to us is because God is trying to blindside us. God doesn't want us to know what's going on. But then he starts to look at some other things too, right? He says, listen. I'm looking out there. I'm living my life. I'm depressed already. I can't feel God. And I see in the injustices that, that are out there. And I see the wickedness of men. You can look at that in chapter 3, 16 through 22. And this is what the preacher saw. In the place of judgment, there was corruption. And in the place of righteousness, there was corruption. In the place of judgment, he says, I see corruption. So in the lawmakers and the police, and he says, I see, you know, those that are over us that are supposed to be making sure that we're all law-abiding citizens, they were doing it too. But he says, even in church, where righteousness should be, I see corruption. And that's important for us to keep in mind. He was, again, looking at the negative things. What he reasoned, though, was that God will judge the righteous and the wicked. There must be a time for every purpose and for every work. God evidently allows injustice to test the hearts of men. Injustice is in our world because of sin. Amen. I don't believe God places any injustices here. We have the ability to do wrong all by ourselves without the devil. Yes, the devil did it in the garden, messed up Adam and Eve and caused them to be able to see or understand good from evil. It was not their time to. It was not within the, the scope of God's plan for them at that time to know good from evil. They weren't ready for that if God was ever going to even reveal good uh, from evil from them. Adam and Eve, they were not ready for that. But because they stepped, and this is why some of us, we should never step out of our season. Never step out of your season. You may be gifted, I always tell our church, you may be gifted above and beyond anybody you know, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's time for your gifting to be implemented to work because you're stepping out of season. There's some things we need to learn first. And, and sometimes, you know, I, I, I've, I've dealt with people in the past, they love God's word so much, they love to go out and witness, and they want to become a preacher. But first of all, I don't know if you had a call on your life to become a preacher, I don't know if you've got a call on your life uh, to go out there now. Did, did, is God ready to release you? Should we go out and witness? Absolutely. Should we go out and share the word of God? That's different. When you have a call on your life to be a preacher, you're going to deal with demonic spirits and forces at every level. As deeper, The deeper you go in God, the more demonic spirits Satan is going to release against you to bring you down. 
So you don't want to open yourself up to things that you are not ready to handle because you don't have a walk with God consistent with the kinds of demonic forces that's coming against you. So you have to know, listen to those that God has placed over you and be willing to wait on your gifting, wait on your calling, wait on your anointing to be released. Even the apostle Paul had to wait. He was an awesome teacher, doctor of the law, but yet still he had to sit under those that didn't even have the knowledge that he had until they released him, laid hands on him and released him into ministry. Amen. And also he had help when they released him. So let's not rush our lives and listen to what, what, what this, this poor preacher was talking about. Here he is, and I'm almost through. Um, the, the, the injustices, God evidently brings these things to, to test our hearts. And so I don't believe that God brings the injustices, but he'll use those things. And what the preacher concluded is that there is nothing better than rejoicing in one's own works, which is his heritage. When you have labored and done things with your hands and you see that you're, whatever it is you're doing is touching lives and you're a blessing to somebody else, there's just something that happens in your spirit, in your heart, and you get up every morning ready to, to face that day, ready to take anything on because you know that God is using you. And that's where we need to be as the people of God. Let's go really quickly to chapter 4. The preacher is continuing here to, to, to kind of look at some things. And uh, he's sharing his observations that he's gleaned. And uh, in earlier, he's, he's related the injustices that he saw. But now we're told he considered those who were oppressed with no comforter. Almighty God, mighty God. Can we just uh, share some things with you today? The injustices are there and the wickedness of men. Amen. The preacher says, I saw all of those things, but then I saw that men were oppressed. And what the preacher reviewed through this is that he considered the oppression done under the sun and saw the tears of the oppressed who had no comforter. They had no comforter. There are too many Christians that's acting like they don't have a comforter. You know what? Loneliness is something that is very real. I don't care if you live in a house with five, ten people. You can be in a house with so many people and still feel so alone. Amen. And so sometimes people think, if I could just find somebody in my life, if I could just you know, find that person that I can get married to, and, and, and it'll just fix all of my loneliness. Really? Look at these eyes. You would, in some situations, wish you had never been in a relationship that you were all by your lonesome and just waiting for God to bring the right person. Listen, finding somebody to make us happy is not where happiness comes from. We have to be happy first before you find somebody. Because if you can't ha be happy without somebody in your life, you won't be happy with somebody in your life. And that's why we need to build our relationship with God. And so what he's finding here is that the, there are people he felt that had nobody to comfort them. He observed power on the sides of the oppressors, but no one, no one to comfort those who were oppressed and that were going through their struggles. And this is what he reasoned. He reasoned that, you know what? The dead are better off than the living. The dead are better off than the living. Now, why would he say that? He was saying that if we never existed, we would have never been in the situation that we're in right now. You know, that sounds to me like the depths of depression. <laughs> Amen. You know, you read this, you have to kind of read it with the understanding. That's the depths of depression. He wasn't just looking at other people's lives because he was so concerned about other people that were depressed with no comforter. And that, you know, it's just better off that they were just never born. No, he was concerned because he saw himself in that situation. And he was like, this whole world is a mess. There's no hope for anybody. You know what I call that? Despair. And there are many Christians that are right there in the throes, the, 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 in, 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 in the, 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 the clutches, if you will, of despair. Because we're not having that relationship with God, deep relationship that can kind of like help you when you're going through that depression. Uh, you know, well, Christians shouldn't go through depression. Um, that's a lie from the pits of hell. 
people go through down seasons. Come on, somebody. People go through times when you feel like all you want to do is just wrap up in a blanket and just cry. Because you just, yeah, you know God is going to be there for you. And and that's that's the time when you kind of like break out with worship. You break out with the word of God. You break out with a time before God and you cry to God. And you know what? Anybody that has a walk with God will always tell you that when you get to that point and you begin to worship God, begin to seek God, read the word and just focus on him, you get out of that. And you wonder, how, why in the world did I get there in the first place? Because Satan uses those emotions against each and every one of us to bring us down so that we cannot be optimized for God's purposes. Amen. And so he was really struggling and he reasoned here that the dead are better off than the living. The dead are better off than the living. But look at this. He says, look. Not only are the dead better off than the living, but I, it's just a waste of my time to, to work. It doesn't matter whether I'm skillful at what I'm doing. All of this, it, it just causes others to be envious of, of everything that I have. Did you ever find that no matter how hard you work, all you ever find are haters? They, they, they just want to find something wrong with you. That's what he's talking about here. When you do everything and you're doing it right and you're loving God and you're seeking God, someone will always come by and try to make you feel like, you know what, um, you're not all that. You never said you were all that, but that's what they're bringing to the table. What bothers me personally, because I see it so often, is that God's people buy into that and they begin to feel what these people are bringing to them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They begin to sow seeds and we begin to receive those seeds and allow them to grow. That's right. The next time somebody comes and tells you that nonsense, you simply ignore them. You continue to work as hard as you're working. You continue to enjoy what you're doing. I know people that have left jobs because of people. They were happy doing what they were doing, but because of people, they walked away. There was nothing going on but that that person or those individuals were jealous of your success and you allowed them to cause you to walk away from a blessing that God had placed in your life. Child of God, stop listening to people. Stop listening to people. When you know you're doing the right things and you're not out there trying to hurt anybody and uh, God help you if you're, if you've got other people that you're trying to sow seeds um, into against somebody else, well, I'm going to tell you you're wrong. So if you think you're right, no, you're wrong. But when you know that you've not done anything to anybody, you've not even spoken a word to anybody about that person, just continue to walk in God and let God do what God wants to do in your life. So let's look at some things here. Vanity. Vanity breeds uh, envy in other people. That's what it does. They're jealous. So he saw the toil and the skillful labor uh, that is it's envied by others too easily. Amen. Uh, we will allow these things to come into our lives and destroy us. And there are two ways to react to this. Number one, do nothing. And the fool does nothing and consumes his own flesh. Yeah. You see, this is what happens. We, we say, you know what, God, I'm not going to fight for what is right. I'm not, even, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to walk away. I'm not going to pour myself into trying to just, you know, wait this out. I'm, I'm just going to sit here and do nothing. But my mama always said that God helps those who helps themselves. That's why I said at the beginning, even if you're not happy in the job, don't just quit the job because that's a foolish decision. If you're not happy, um, you know, with with um, a particular business that you're running, don't just close the business. If you're making money to pay the bills, just do what you got to do while you're working on something else. But the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. We are not that person. And so we should say, God, I trust you to bring me out of this thing. And it's better to have a little with quietness. So while you're going through what you're going through, you haven't made it yet. While you're you're working hard and you 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 can't seem to make ends meet, inroads in 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 your career, you you know you're not getting to the next level like you want to be. Don't be stressed out over any of that. It's better to have a little with quietness. You know you got Jesus. 
Amen. Than to have a whole lot and to have a miserable life. Amen. So let's get on to the next thing. The vanity of isolation. So you know what I'm going to do, Pastor? I, I'm just done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm, I, I don't like people. I was never a people person anyway. And, and so, you know, I'm just going to do what I need to do all by my lonesome. <laughs> See, you can't run. You can't hide. At some point, you're going to need somebody. Can't run and you can't hide. And so he says here that there are people who do not want to be around anybody. But he says a person who was alone without companion or son or brother was not a good thing. He says that was vanity. With no end to his labors, no satisfaction with his riches, with all the things that he had acquired. He says this was vanity and a grave misfortune. Vanity and a grave misfortune. Hold on now. You need friends. Because you see, two are better than one. For they have good reward for their labor, the Bible says. When you are by yourself, you are not protected. Nobody watching your back. When you're by yourself, you're not protected. You're, you're going to struggle all by yourself. Nobody to call. But when you've got someone, and choose your friends carefully. Don't just choose people because they are friendly to you. You know, you have to know them. The Bible says that labor among you. So you got to kind of know somebody before, you know, you start sharing the personal stuff. Amen. And so be careful when you do that. But when you are alone, the devil is going to move in and you are unprotected and you will be destroyed. A three stranded rope, someone once said, is easily snapped. Amen. Then, of course, the vanity of popularity. Amen. The vanity of popularity. So, there's a story of a poor, wise young person, a young man who is better, um, wiser than uh, a foolish king who was in his prime now. And this king just didn't know which way um, up was or bottom was. He didn't know which way end the end was. Uh, just, just confused all the time. He was replaced by this young person. And this young king did so much. And it's important for us to know that everybody's looking for their five minutes of fame. Everybody's looking for it. You see it all the time. Uh, well, we don't see it now, do we? Uh, when you go on Facebook and probably still on Instagram, but uh, not so much on Facebook, but people are doing selfies and it's all about me. You know, that that's selfishness. Me, 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 me. And now things have shifted. Now we're talking about those that's on the front lines. We're talking about um, making sure that we're doing for others and hopefully more people will be that way. But uh, when you're looking for your five minutes of fame, that's all it's going to be. Because when this particular person that became king, who was so popular, and began to do all the things that the previous older king, who had just lived his days and just didn't know which way, um, with know which way end was, or you know, up bottom was, or the top was, this particular person that took over realized that their popularity was short-lived. Popularity is short-lived. So yes, a month and a half ago, the malls were filled with a lot of people that went out there dressed to the nines from head to toe, not a hair out of place. That's right. The makeup was nice and everybody looked good and they made sure that people, listen, once you take all that stuff off, people don't even, don't even know who you are sometimes. I actually saw someone one time and didn't recognize them because th th that wasn't the person. When you take off all of the facade out of life, you're left with you. And this is what he was saying. The vanity of going out there and working hard, the vanity of going out there and trying to uh, master yourself popularity, the vanity of trying to have everybody say, oh, you're so good at what you do. Oh, man, you're better than everybody else. That's short lived. At the end of the day, you and I are going home with you. Amen. And so we need a walk with God. 
And this is what the preacher discovered, that in spite of all that he was going through, in spite of all that he had observed, his hard work, doing all the things that he was doing with his heart, pouring himself into what he loved to do with his hands and accomplishing things and going home and being unhappy. He says, listen, when I started doing for others from my heart and when I started to realize that I needed God in my life, I needed to have a relationship with God and I was doing these things with the right heart, the right spirit, the right frame of mind. He says, that's what brings the joy. Read it for yourself. First chapter, second chapter, the third chapter and the fourth chapters. And he assimilated into this and realized that all that he had done in his life, all he had spent all his money on in his life, just came to absolutely nothing, even when he poured his heart into it. Because number one, God wasn't in it. And number two, he was doing it all for the wrong reasons. And so I want to leave this with you. What is the meaning of life for you? The wise King Solomon suggests that all your labors must be God-based and the pouring out of your substance to those you love and to those who are in need. That is what brings satisfaction and joy. I hope the word of God touched your heart tonight. Um, I, I'm going to pray for you right now that if there's someone that has never given your life to God, that you would hear this prayer tonight and repent of your sins and be baptized in the precious name of, name of Jesus Christ, and God will fill you with his Holy Spirit. Master, we come to you tonight. I pray for those who are asking God for a deliverance in their lives. Help them to realize that they need to repent, that is to turn away from their sins, turn away from the life that they were living, and to turn it over to you. God, I pray that they will reach out to me, God, and say, Pastor, I want to be baptized in the precious name of Jesus. Pastor, I want the Spirit of God in my life. And mighty God, may we be able to teach them and to lead them to a closer walk with you. Forgive us of our sins. Touch our hearts and help us again to glorify you, Lord. Lord, we give you praise, glory, and honor even during these times, mighty God. And we ask, God, that you would bless and protect and keep all of your children. And everybody said, in Jesus' name, amen. Just want to remind you that um, next week we're going to begin with um, Bible studies on um, at 7 p.m. Um, beginning next Wednesday and there are um, after Bible studies will be at 7 p.m. Notify all those that you're inviting um, on to listen. And on this Friday, this Friday, we're going to be having corporate prayer right here on Facebook. I'm excited about this and uh, we're using a totally different format and I'm personally just excited by the, the responses from uh, those who are going to be a part of this. And so those of you, uh, you know who you are that I've spoken to, tomorrow is the deadline. You got to get these things to me. Listen to them. Make sure that everything is a-okay and I will see you again. God bless you. Love you. Stay safe in Jesus. Amen. Love y'all.